Welcome back, everyone. We're going to start off um, this afternoon's panel. Um, I'm Becky Johnson, and I'm Assistant General Counsel at R Plus Energies, which develops solar, wind, and pump storage projects. I'm thrilled to be moderating this panel today and to be a part of the Stegner Symposium. The Stegner Center was a very important part of my time here as a um, law student and now in my professional career for um, all of the opportunities for educational opportunities like this. So the objective of this panel today, which is on the energy transition in Utah, is to bring home the various concepts, ideas, and issues discussed over the last two days of the symposium. To address how the energy transition is playing out in Utah from the perspective of some of the leaders navigating the transition in our state. Our panelists today are Mason Baker, CEO and General Manager for the Utah Associated Municipal Power System. <laughs> Sorry. Um, Michelle Campo, Region 7 Renewable Energy Program Coordinator at the Department of the Interior Bureau of Land Management. Commissioner Tony Martinez, Carbon County, Utah Board of Commissioners. Christine Michael, Founder and Principal of Enyo Renewable Energy and Sarah Wright, founder and CEO of Utah Clean Energy. Before we turn to our panelists, I'd like to begin by providing you all with a brief overview of the lay of the land with respect to energy development in the state. Where we've been, where we are, we, where we are and a little bit of a glimpse of what's ahead. The trends noted on the following slides align a lot with what Professor Class actually uh, discussed during her keynote, but we'll focus more directly on Utah. Historically in Utah and still today, coal dominates the energy production with carbon and emery counties playing a vital role in providing the coal resources that have fueled the state's growth. There was a dramatic increase in energy production in the state with the opening of the Intermountain Power Plant, a coal-fired plant near Delta in 1986. However, beginning after the 2008 recession, Utah coal production and energy production therefrom began to decline due to growing use of natural gas and renewables, coal resources being mined out, and coal generally falling out of favor as an energy source, among other reasons. The state's natural gas and crude oil production also rose steadily in the 1980s. Oil started dropping off a bit after 2008 and natural gas after 2012. However, not shown on this graph is that in the last couple of years, oil and gas production has actually increased again, primarily due to um, impacts from geopolitical instability. On the state's renewable side, you can see that traditional hydroelectric power has dominated the state's renewable resources. There are numerous small hydroelectric facilities across the state, many of which can be seen along the canyons um, along the Salt Lake Valley. Many of those have been in operation for most of the past century, with the oldest dating back to 1896. With the construction of the Flaming Gorge hydroelectric plant on the Green River in 1963, there was a substantial increase in hydropower generation. The state added conventional geothermal energy with the opening of the Blundell Geothermal Power Plant in 1984. Thereafter, the largest spike in renewable production came after 2008 with the first wind farms, followed by the first utility scale solar projects in 2015, with sharp increases in development since then. Although the state has seen a drastic increase in renewable energy production, this has not made up for the decrease in production from fossil fuel resources, as well as increasing consumption in the state. So for the first time since the 1970s, Utah is now actually a net energy importer. I'm not gonna go into too much detail on this slide, but this just highlights the energy consumption in Utah by source, which more or less follows um, the same uh, 
pattern as with generation. Uh, you will notice, though, that uh, fossil fuels are still the primary um, uh, energy source for consumption. And I also want to just flag that, you know, although Utah has started developing more wind and solar projects, a lot of that energy is being exported out of state. So focusing in on electricity generation, these charts depict the substantial change in generation sources since 2003. Coal, of course, still dominates generation. However, natural gas and renewables have been taking an increasingly larger share with that trend expected to continue. Looking now at how Utah compares with other states on renewable generation, this map depicts percentage of generation from wind, solar, and hydro across the country. You can see that Utah has a lower percentage of generation than other Western states. I note that many of the other Western states either have substantial traditional hydroelectric facilities, as in the Pacific Northwest, as well as large utility wind scale projects, as in the middle of the country. Utah doesn't have the same level of natural resources to support conventional hydropower and wind projects as in these states, so that's largely what accounts for that difference. Let's take a closer look then at the state's primary renewable sources. In 2013, geothermal, hydropower, and wind resources had similar production levels. But with the introduction of utility-scale solar projects beginning in 2015, solar now powers about 93% of Utah's new electric generating capacity. In the next few slides, we'll take a closer look at these renewable resources and projects in the state. Wind resources. This map identifies location in the state in yellow that have been identified as wind energy zones that are favorable for successful wind development. The first utility scale wind project, the 19 megawatt Spanish Fork wind project, which Christine was involved with developing, was built in 2008. Subsequently, two large wind projects have been built in the state, Milford Wind in the Southwest and Latigo Wind in the Southeast, which Christine was also uh, very involved in developing. Moving on to solar, as previously noted, solar dominates renewable production in the state. An arid state with abundant sunshine, Utah has a favorable landscape and climate for solar projects. This map highlights locations that have been targeted for solar development with those in red and orange with the highest direct natural irradiance. The southwest part of the state is particularly a great climate for these projects, so I'm highlighting here um, some of the projects that have been developed in that area. The first utility-scale solar project in Utah, the Utah Red Hills, a 104-megawatt facility, was built in 2015. And since then, there's been about 1.6 gigawatt of installed utility-scale solar in Utah with an additional 715 megawatts expected to be installed in 2024. Most of the development has been in the southwest part of the state. However, there are current and planned projects throughout the state. And I will note that this map is from 2020, so it doesn't fully capture the amount of de development even just in the past few years. Moving to geothermal. Geothermal, um, Utah is one of seven states with utility-scale electricity generation from geothermal sources, with some of the best potential for geothermal development in the country. The map identifies in yellow those areas that have been identified as best suited for geothermal development. The first geothermal project in Utah was the Blundell Geothermal Plant, a conventional plant commissioned in 1984 and later expanded. Utah is also host to uh, two notable projects applying enhanced geothermal system technologies. This includes the Utah Frontier Observatory for Research in Geothermal Energy, also called FORGE, which is a dedicated underground field laboratory sponsored by the U.S. Department of Energy. The company Fervo Energy also recently announced its Cape Station project in the same area, adjacent to the FORGE project which is a multi-phase geothermal facility utilizing enhanced geothermal technology. The first phase is expected to be operational in 2026. With respect to hydropower, in addition to the conventional hydroelectric projects in the state, there are numerous pump storage hydro projects in development throughout the state, of which seven have received FERC preliminary permits. 
Finally, I want to briefly touch on some other energy transition projects in the state, some of which will also be discussed in more depth later in the panel. These include biomass projects such as the Align Renewable Natural Gas Facility near Milford, Utah, which started operations in 2021. This is a partnership between Dominion Energy and Smithfield Foods that captures methane from hog farms to turn into clean energy. There's also expected to be a dramatic increase in battery energy storage systems. These are anticipated to be standardly co-located with new renewable generating facilities, as well as standalone facilities located closer to or within municipalities. Near Delta, Utah, adjacent to the site of the Intermountain Power Plant, the Advanced Clean Energy Storage Hub is under construction, which will be a hydrogen production and storage facility utilizing salt caverns to store clean hydrogen. Nuclear is also being considered within the state. Um, in its latest integrated resource plan, Pacific Corp, Pacific Corp had indicated that it's considering advanced small modular reactors or SMRs to be located at retired coal plants. And finally, with the advancement in technology for carbon capture utilization and storage, there are several sites being investigated for potential application of this technology. So with that context on the state, we'd like to dive a bit deeper into the energy transition in Utah. The symposium started off with keynote presentations on the urgency of the transition and forging a path to a clean energy future. What does that look like for us here in Utah? a conservative state with a strong history of fossil fuel development that still plays an important role in the state. I would like to invite Sarah Wright with Utah Clean Energy, who for the past 20 years has been at the forefront of mitigating climate change in Utah and advocating for a clean energy transition in the state to speak to the urgency of the transition in Utah and how Utah is forging a path to a clean energy future. All right, thanks, Becky, and thanks to all of you for hanging in there after two days of energy transition. Um, when I heard the, the bio, it says 20 years, but I've been working on this really now, when I look at it, almost a quarter century, working on energy transition in Utah, and um, we were off to a slow start, but I think things are starting to move a, a lot faster, and Utah Clean Energy we are a 501c nonprofit, nonpartisan public interest group that is solely committed. Our whole purpose for being is to address climate change. And we started doing this when there weren't very many people talking about climate change in Utah. So it's nice to have all you here. So um, there was some discussion that, um, that this is a hard thing to do, that we don't know how to get there, but really we know what we need to do especially from the energy perspective, and it's really getting to zero emissions. It's in our homes and our buildings. It's making them super efficient and all electric and making sure that the homes from everything from affordable housing to our big commercial buildings are, start, are built that way from the start now, but also figuring out how to retrofit those homes and buildings. Um, it's decarbonizing our transportation. We just work on the electrification side, medium heavy duty trucks and um, charging infrastructure, but there's all the other solutions with transit, walkable, bikeable communities, um, everything getting to zero there. And what this conference has been about is if we electrify our transportation and electrify our homes and buildings and we don't get our grid to zero, we're never going to um, reach the carbon goals that we need to, to create a livable planet for the generations to come. And we found in Utah um, that individual action, well, it's everywhere. Individual action will only take us so far. So we need political leadership and we need the policies, the programs, the investments. And so you may remember there was an election in 2016 and that's when Utah Clean Energy really doubled down in this space, and we've created a climate and clean air compact with over 180 leaders that recognize the urgency for climate action and recognize the areas that we need to work. We still have a, lot, a long way to go with this group and the legislative session, which we'll hear more about, but there's a lot of momentum in Utah, and there's a lot of people that care about this, and we are a caring and pragmatic state. So. I'm still pretty bullish on this. I guess you have to be fairly optimistic to work in this space for a long time, but definitely not giving up. 
I was going to talk a little bit about climate urgency and climate opportunity, but I think that we've heard enough here. We are seeing Utah is warming, um, obviously faster than the global average. Uh, we're seeing droughts that's impacting our water resources, snow impact. You know, we've had a couple good years, but that doesn't fix it. But what I'd like to speak a little bit about is our trajectory over time. I think that Becky laid that out pretty well, but it's interesting to think about. So this is my son, Eli. I started this work when he was three. We had a 115 kilowatt solar project at Dangling Rope Marina and uh, the Blundell Geothermal Project. That was the extent pretty much of the renewable energy in the state at that time and hardly any, any energy efficiency programs. He might have been about eight here, but this is when we got the first wind pro project that was close to Utah, and I think UAMPS might have been an off-taker from Evanston. Is that right? And so it took us a long time even to get there. But now we are, we're going from that, that he's almost 27 now, not so fresh-faced, but um, still a great human being. We're getting to this place on the curve where things are starting to happen rapidly. And I also think that that's part of why we had, for those of you in Utah, the backlash that we have seen in the last legislative session. But we have to remember that the momentum is on our side. Uh, renewables are being developed faster than ever before. They're more affordable. Efficiency is key. We also need to electrify because fugitive emissions from natural gas in the Uinta Basin, I'm hearing between, I don't know, six and 8% or five and 8%. And methane emissions are a much more potent greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide lives in the atmosphere longer, but methane is really potent. So we have to rapidly move away from natural gas use at the same time that we are um, electrifying. I mean, at the same time that we're cleaning up our electrical system. So, um, I think it was uh, Professor Class that first started talking about this, that what we're trying to also do, we're creating a climate vision platform, but we're also trying to tell the story because climate solutions aren't about less. And it's really about more. Clean energy is getting cheaper than ever before. It's definitely cheaper than traditional resources. Battery storage prices are falling. You combine batteries with renewable projects and you now have a dispatchable resource. Rural communities, there are rural communities that will definitely need to transition. And we need to make sure that they have the resources to transition because we built our economy on the backs of coal-fired generation. But there are a lot of jobs that are coming to these and, and economic development that are coming to these communities. Um, and there's been some studies that show up to 4.1 billion by the Western Way. And then jobs, who here wants to guess the clean energy resource? We have about 40,000 clean energy jobs in Utah now. Who wants to guess where the bulk of those jobs are? Pardon? Yes, <laughs> the unsung hero of, oh, it was Sophie, thank you. <laughs> we always forget about efficiency, but there's, um, that's a big part of our, the energy solution. And when I think back to where we were when I started this, the prevailing wisdom was if we can reduce our emissions 2% per year back in 2001 when I started this, we would be on track for to stabilize the climate and avoid that 1.5 degree cutoff, which we're going to shoot by. Um, right now where we are globally, it's about a seven, seven and a half percent reduction per year, but the developed countries are going to have to take a bigger share of that. So that's what we really need to do is a 15% reduction per year in greenhouse gases year over year. So it's not going to be easy, but it's definitely doable and Utah can play a role. And the other thing, of course, as we address climate solutions, we create healthier communities, cleaner air, um, more sustainable energy sources. There's really, it's what not to like about moving forward. And I think we need to help change that dialogue. So this is a slide with a lot of data, but I think it's important for us to think about this. And I'm one of those wonky people that every year I go and look at the billion dollar storms that climate fueled billion dollar disasters, including wildfires, storms, flooding, and NOAA tracks this data. And um, when we think about the cost of climate, we need to think about the cost of inaction. So the FAR, um, 
right side of this graph. Sorry, I had to turn and get the right way. <laughs> right side of this graph shows um, it's the five-year average from 2003 back, and it was over $600 billion um, in economic impact from these storms. So when you look at the whole Inflation Reduction Act, all the tax incentives, et cetera, and they're estimating that is about $780 billion, which is a lot of money. But the cost of inaction is great. And it's not, these aren't just, this, these aren't just dollars. These are families. These are livelihoods. Um, these, you know, it's actually impacts to, to life as well in these. And it's only billion dollar events. So how many of you followed the fires in the Texas Panhandle recently? It, it was pretty tragic, but that was only what they're estimating is about a 250, so a quarter billion dollars. So disasters like that are not included in this tracking. So I know that not all policymakers will um, be open to this sort of logic, but there is a huge cost to inaction. And I think that it's our job to help people and our policymakers and community members understand that. So this is what many of us were jumping up and down for joy um, when Pacificor, which is the parent company for Rocky Mountain Power, um, released their integrated resource plan um, August? Not, not that long ago. And the green line in this graph is the clean energy development that they had planned going out to 2034. And the black line was their planned decrease in fossil fuel use, including the retirement of Hunter and Huntington Coal Plant in 2032. Admittedly, they also had some magic resources in that they thought they would be able to build, and some of them weren't even identified. Um, um, but in working in the legislative session, and we're going to give a rundown of that um, in a while, I um, mean, later in this panel, Speaking to some of the legislators, they said the, the, the match that really struck this fire and made the legislature want to move so was the final straw was the fact that they were retiring those coal plants in 2032. And so we need to have more dialogue and really figure out the right solutions so we don't have these backlashes going forward. And what else sort of are some of the potential and uh, the headwinds? So I put Pacific Core's Integrated Resource Plan. And for those of you that don't know Integrated Resource Planning, I just want to say that that is, so the utility looks at every hour of every day, you know, what the load might be with multiple scenarios and all the resources with all their economics and all of their characteristics and incorporating risk. They find the least cost, least risk way to meet those demands. And that was the chart that I just showed you. So Pacific Work IRP, um, the other things that um, I think that are important, we've talked about the Inflation Reduction Act and other investments that are available, um, then the Beehive Emission Reduction Act. So I've been working on this in a long time. The last time the state started to work on climate emission reduction, greenhouse gas emissions, was under Governor Huntsman back in, I think, 2006. So this is, even though it's a much smaller initiative, DEQ is looking at ways to reduce emissions. Local governments have committed to 100% renewable energy and they're moving forward on uh, looking how they procure that. And then the things that we don't really know are um, how these new policies that were just passed and also wildfire liability that we'll probably talk about. Pacific War um, was found negligent for starting some fires in Oregon, which they have lawsuits up to $7 billion. So that impacts the utility. So that's sort of a quick framework on what's happening in Utah. Hopefully I wasn't over my, too much over my 10 minutes. Okay, <laughs> thanks. Thank you, Sarah. So a successful energy transition in Utah will ensure that our communities are provided with reliable and affordable energy sources, a role in which utilities and power providers play an important role. UAMPS is a political subdivision of the state of Utah that provides wholesale electric energy transmission and other energy services on a nonprofit basis to community-owned power systems throughout the Intermountain West. 
I'd like to invite Mason to discuss how electricity providers like UAMPS are navigating the transition and to discuss the opportunities and challenges for electricity providers during this transition. Is this on? Yep. Okay. Um, thanks, Becky. Uh, just to start off, I really appreciate the opportunity to be with you all. Um, like Becky, I'm an alum and um, spent a lot of time with folks in this room. And it certainly means a lot to be back here for a Stegner Center event and be a presenter because without the faculty here, I certainly would not be in the role that I'm in today. Um, so give you an update on what UAMPS has been up to, um, a little bit, of, a little more background on what type of organization we are. Uh, we were formed in 1980. We provide wholesale electric services to our members who are predominantly um, municipals that own their own electric distribution systems. Um, so we're effectively their wholesale provider. Um, you can see here we're in seven Western states. Most of our members of the 50, 37 are in Utah. Um, we have 16 different projects that we do for these members. Um, these are, you mostly think of these as generation type projects uh, to provide them wholesale electric power. Uh, we are not for profit. Last point up here is member autonomy. Um, something that's very unique about our organization. Uh, there are other organizations like us in the US our members get to select what the portfolio of generating assets that serve their communities are comprised of. Um, so we give them that sort of decision-making autonomy. Um, so what we've been doing and what we're focusing here, you can see in this, this Venn diagram, as we navigate this energy transition that we've been talking about over the last two days. Um, and I will say that um, what we're experiencing now, we've been experiencing really for um, probably since 2008, but we're starting to realize some of the impacts of the transition and we're doubling down on a lot of these initiatives, in particular, long-term planning. I'll get into what we've been doing in our integrated resource planning. Um, we're heavy into exploring new resources as we've talked about over the last two days. Um, we're moving away from legacy generating assets as part of this energy transition in Utah. Um, you know, these are 40 year assets and all of a sudden we're looking at building a lot of new generation that's not the same type of generation. Um, we're no longer doing generation that is very energy dense. It happens to be pretty dispersed and that brings a lot of interesting complications that we need to plan for. Um, so there's a lot of new resource procurement that we're doing at the UAMPS level. Um, and then lastly is optimizing our existing resources. We've heard about it, how difficult it is to get on new resources, given interconnection, queue issues, building new transmission. All the new resources we're planning, we're anticipating basically a five to seven year process. Um, and that's doing a fair amount of pre-planning starting um, prior to that. So that's, that's the difficulty that we're uh, looking at right now. Um, but it's something that we'll move through and navigate for our members. As I mentioned, you know, we have been going through this energy transition really, um, I think since 2008. Um, and this gives you a sense by resource type, what was providing the energy to our member um, communities. Uh, you can see the orange is back in 2008. Um, you know, we were heavy into coal. Um, the other thing to point out is the blue hydro. Um, we continue um, to be pretty reliant on the Colorado River storage projects, Glen Canyon and Flaming Gorge, um, and a fair amount of reliance on the wholesale electric market. Um, that is that purple purchases. Um, that reliance um, over the last several years has become much more volatile than it used to be as a lot of existing capacity, namely coal plants, has been getting retired. Um, so it has not been a, a safe place to be um, having that sort of exposure to the wholesale electric market. Um, the other piece in 2008, uh, natural gas, 
Um, and as we look sort of into the middle pie chart, we can, what I'd point out as far as a trend is the shift from coal to gas. Um, they somewhat have flipped. Um, we anticipate the um, coal will continue to shrink and uh, natural gas will take over that coal. And you can see that in our 2030 projections. Um, you can also see in the 2030, excuse me, 2023 pie chart there, heavy reliance on the wholesale electric market. Yesterday afternoon, um, there was the engineering professor that identified some of the um, stress on the Western grid that happened in 2022. Um, you know, that was not a good time to have that sort of reliance on the wholesale electric market. Um, other things to point out, you know, we've been getting into more renewables since 2008. Um, additional solar, um, that's going to continue to grow, as you can see in the 2030 um, pie there. Um, we're also forecasting a shortage. Um, it could be wholesale market purchases, but again, as we move forward, we're going to be minimizing our exposure to the wholesale electric market because of the pricing volatility that we anticipate to continue moving forward. Um, as we have a lot of the legacy assets come off in the Western system. Um, another thing to note here in the 2030 pie is nuclear. Um, we are anticipating um, as part of this, and we're revising our IRP assumptions, um, this was going to be our carbon-free power project, was, which was a new nuclear project that we have been developing for more or less a decade that we terminated last fall. Um, so we're going to be revising this assumption, um, anticipate that some of this would be made up with um, some combination of solar and batteries as well as natural gas. We're still um, very interested in looking at nuclear moving forward. Um, we see given um, interconnection issues, the need to do the transition as quickly as possible, that new nuclear must play a role moving forward, um, just being very pragmatic about um, the challenge that we're up against. Um, there are large commercial challenges associated with do, doing new nuclear, which I think we'll get into as part of this discussion. So a little more specifics on um, some of the takeaways from I, our IRP um, that we've been doing is um, we do have a, a going need for doing new thermal plant capacity. Um, what this really means is new natural gas. The new natural gas Facilities that we will look at will have the ability to um, burn alternative fuels in them, whether it's ammonia or hydrogen. Um, and that's part of you know, making sure that we're being mindful of the GHG emissions associated with those facilities. Um, they will still have NOx emissions associated with hydrogen and ammonia. Um, so that is certainly another concern given human health impacts associated with pneumonia. Um, to complement renewables that we're um, aggressively pursuing, we also see a need for doing peaking natural gas capacity, peaking generation. You can see up here looking at investigating around 200 megawatts of that to integrate renewables into the system. Um, on additional solar and batteries, identified doing 300 megawatts of new solar, about 150 of batteries. Um, we'll probably do a contract this year for about 100 of new solar and about 50 of new batteries. Um, that's underway. Uh, third takeaway is preserving our Nebo natural gas plant and the Hunter coal plant. And, you know, just very open about this point. As we undertake this transition, we have to be mindful and doing it in a very phased manner. Um, and given the fact that there are going to be cost impacts as we take resources offline and put new resources in, this is one thing we need to navigate. Um, the other fact that we have to be mindful of is just that it takes five to seven years to put on any sort, sort of new significant resource. Um, we talked about the interconnection queue and the delays there. Um, Pacific Corp has proposed um, pausing that process. And we'll find out today whether that request to pause it has been granted by the FERC. Um, so that's just you know one roadblock to think about as we go through this energy transition. It's part of the background behind this takeaway in particular. Um, and with that, I think that 
is what I had. I appreciate the time. Thank you, Mason. And we'll definitely um, discuss coal and nuclear a little bit more later. So the state, based on the presentations that we've seen, will obviously need more electric generation and storage facilities to meet the growing demand and to replace the fossil fuel sources that are being retired, a role that developers play an important role in. Throughout her career, Christine has played an important role in creating the state's renewable energy program in the early 2000s, and since then has been successfully developing projects in the state and region. I'd like to invite Christine to talk about the development of renewable projects in Utah and how we meet the need for new renewable generation facilities in our state. Thank you, Becky, and thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, this wonderful panel today. Um, like uh, Becky and Mason, I am an alum, not of the law school, but of uh, the MBA program here. Um, another uh, piece I'd like to bring up, just in case I forget in my talk, uh, one of the projects that I developed here in Utah um, called the Castle Project in Emory County um, on state institutional trust lands or trust lands administration land. Uh, Troy is here, um, the landowner with CITLA. Um, the, the project, it's a 40 megawatt solar project, 20 megawatts of which um, will be coming to the University of Utah when that comes online here in the next, hopefully, several weeks. So proud alumni and um, proud solar developer to be powering some of this great university. Um, so a little bit about Enyo Renewable Energy. Um, we formed Enyo Renewable Energy in 2016. Um, prior to that, I was the CEO of Wasatch Wind. Um, Enyo Renewable Energy is based in Salt Lake City. We're in a hydroelectric plant at the base of Little Cottonwood Canyon. Um, small team, there are about 10 of us on the team right now, but prior to that, it was myself and a few others. And, I pretty much do, or we, our team pretty much does everything. I meet with landowners. I work on interconnections with utility, permit the projects. I go to landowner meetings. I have open houses. I present to city councils, county commissions. So I do, our company does everything nuts to bolts from beginning until a power purchase agreement is signed or executed. And then we typically sell it to somebody that's much larger than us that can build, own, and operate it. And um, like Sarah, I've been in the renewable energy space uh, for longer than I care to remember. Fortunately, I just got my hair cut the other day and somehow the grays went away. But before that, you'd have noticed a lot of gray in my hair because of uh, the, the industry that we've been a part of for 24 years. Um, 24 years ago, uh, it was Sarah and myself. <laughs> we were it. Um, I was at the Utah Energy Office. I started the Renewable Energy Program for the state, and I think I was one of Sarah's first funders um, for Utah Clean Energy. Um, I, I bring this slide up because I think it's really a testament to where we started and where we've come. Um, as I was uh, working for the state of Utah, I, I think I was a little bit of a renegade. Um, I used some federal funds, and we would put up billboards all over the state. One of them you can see here that says, wind power can, funds, uh, can fund schools. We had other billboards that said, uh, wind power saves water. We would put op-eds uh, in the newspaper, a lot of this, these things we would do with Sarah. Um, and in 2002, this is probably my, my most favorite thing to share with people, we had the Olympics. And I don't know how many people were in the Olympics and remember what the mascots were. But for those of you that are not from here or forget, in this picture you can see the rabbit, the white bunny, um, is powder. And then the other two um, mascots represent copper. And does anyone want to guess what the third one is? Cool. <laughs> so um, I think it's just very important to, to, to think about it as we're thinking, as we're going to hopefully host the next Olympics here in 2034 or 32. Um, I don't think that mascot will be used again. So where, so where I think it's always important to understand where we've come from and where we're going. And in Utah, as I think Sarah and both Becky talked about, um, when we started 24 years ago, there was the Blundell power plant. So I like to think we started at ground zero, at zero. So what happened next? How did we, how did we get renewables into the, into the system here? 
Well, in 1978, there was a piece of legislation passed called PERPA, Public Utilities Regulatory Policy Act, and it was right during the energy crisis. And um, at that time, it was basically a piece of legislation where they told utilities, you must buy renewables as long as the price is equal to what it would cost you to avoid building it yourself. And so from, gosh, 20, 2008, which is when the Spanish Fork Wind Project was built that I developed, um, until, as you see here on the screen, 2017, um, many of us who were developing at the time, that's how we were able to get our projects in the ground. Um, we basically forced the utility to take our projects. And under that regime, there were about 731 megawatts that were built, largely most, you know, largely solar. Um, of the 731 megawatts, I guess 80 of those were wind. Those were my projects. And at that time, Sarah and I, um, I want to say, I'd love to take credit. Um, you know, we were responsible for working at the, the, the commission to ensure like what that rate would be so we could get these projects in the ground. And, you know, 731 megawatts, it's, it's not too shabby. Um, at that time, I like to say I was sort of in the shadows, right? I, somebody asked me what I did I, in Utah, in, in Wyoming, because we have projects there as well. I would say, oh, I'm an energy developer. <laughs> I wouldn't like to say that I, I developed renewable energy. But then things started to change. Um, once, uh, I think, once the utility, I think they got a little tired of us forcing them to take our power. And a company that many of you probably have heard of now or maybe use their technology, Facebook, um, bought some land in Utah County and decided to build uh, a data center there. And as part of that evolution, um, uh, many of us came together and realized how can we supply data centers and other customers with renewable energy without for, you know forcing the utility to do that and so out of out of um i, I really say facebook um, but i also would give a, a shout out to the university of utah salt lake city park city um, and others in the community who wanted to see renewables uh, a piece of legislation was passed and that legislation basically allowed pacific core customers to enter into a power purchase agreement with a developer to supply that customer with renewable energy. And some fr so from the period of say 2018 until 2012 or 2022, you can see in this chart about 1500 megawatts or more were put in the ground because of customers asking the utility to supply them with renewable energy. So that at this moment in time, when somebody asked me, uh, what do you do for a living? I would say I develop renewable energy projects. I was I was out of the shadows. Um, so then uh, here we are. Here we are today in 2020. I think 2020 was really that moment in time where Pacific Core uh, uh, put out a request for proposal and asked for renewables. So 2020, that's the big date. That was when Pacific Core said, "Okay, we're ready to take on those resources ourselves." And meet our customers, and that was that was very exciting. Uh, several of our projects, uh, wind and solar projects, were successful in that request for proposal, and are build, being built. Um, shout out to the com my company. Um, we have over a thousand gig or a thousand megawatts that are either operating or under construction currently. And just as a sense of what a thousand megawatts is, it would serve about eighty percent of Salt Lake County. So as you look at these numbers, you can. Maybe that might help you identify what do these numbers equate to. Um, so 2020 was a great year. The RFP came out. Everybody was happy. Almost 1,000 megawatts, so almost all of Salt Lake County's load was going to be met by Pacific Corps actively pursuing renewables. And then this year happened. Um, we were, everybody was excited um, in this chart. I apologize, the, ye the yellow should be um, circling the 20, 2025 to 2027 um, area there. Pacific Corps was essentially going to, or had issued a request for a proposal. They were looking for resources in the 2026 timeframe of about 5,000 megawatts of wind, solar, and storage. And on September 30th of 2023, we received notice that they were going to suspend their request for, for, request for proposal 
And I think it's important to note why they sort of slowed things down or also actually put them to a halt. Um, the wildfire litigation um, that occurred in Oregon. Um, some people estimate that $10 million of liability will come from that fire that occurred in Oregon and Pacific Corps' market cap is $40 billion. So that's what I think is the big reason why Pacific Corps put a pause. Um, some of the other reasons why Pacific Corps said they suspended their RFP was due to federal court stay, the EPA's ozone transportation um, rules and rulemaking with greenhouse gas emissions. So I think this audience here probably understands those two topics better than I do. Um, so then when somebody asked me what I do <laughs> after September 30th, and I said, oh, I'm looking for a job. Um, I, I'm just kidding. I'm not looking for a job. <laughs> Sorry, Diane, one of my colleagues is here. Don't worry. You're OK. <laughs> um, so so as I as I sit here and I think about the future, Mason uh, talked about how the interconnection queue of Rocky Mountain Power is um, is in tatters. Just for some perspective, Rocky Mountain Power's total load on their system is 10,000 megawatts. The interconnection queue in Utah, so companies like mine that want to plug into the system and supply power, there are 27,000 megawatts of renewable energy projects waiting to meet the needs of Pacific Core and UAMPS and Facebook and Google. Um, and all the customers in Utah that want to see green power. And then at the same time, there are 18,000 megawatts of load. People, companies that want to build things and suck power. And so you can see that So the, the, the main issue that we're facing, we're facing a market issue, right? We want to be able to, we want to sell power. Many of us have power to sell. There are people that have load that want to take your power, but the interconnection system or process is broken now. So what do we do? Um, I'm, not, I'm not sure. <laughs> but historically, the way we develop projects, many of the projects that are either under construction or in operations here for us in Utah, we've cited our projects right next to load. So we have a steel project, it's a solar project, the output is going to UAMPS. We cited that project next to Nucor Steel in northern Utah. Uh, we have another project called the Electron Project that's also on Trust Lands land out by US Magnesium. We cited it there because we knew US Magnesium would need to suck it. So in our minds, we've always tried to develop our projects with not thinking about transmission. Where can we cite projects where they need the power? And so from my company's perspective, as we move into the, for, into the, into the future, um, not only are we going to be a company that supplies or wants to supplies power, we're also turning into a company that also um, creates load. So think about the IRA and all the great incentives that we have there and bringing back manufacturing to the US. Um, that's what we're going to be doing. We recently made three load requests to Rocky Mountain Power in three different locations in Utah saying, we need 500 megawatts of load for this um, green manufacturing facility. And Pacific Corps told us in January that they can't supply that load. <laughs> I don't know if you're understanding the situation we're in. 27,000 megawatts of renewables in the interconnection system in Utah. And I have a 500 megawatt uh, manufacturing facility looking to suck that power and Pacific Core can't meet it. So that sounds negative and as of yesterday I, I probably would have been throwing darts at a Pacific Core poster. Um, but <laughs> but um, we had proposed a number of ideas to Pacific Core back in October. Um, we said how about you look at your tariffs and say, if you can have load and generation next to each other, is there a way that we can sort of not worry so much about that interconnection queue where everything is stuck? Um, can we create a flexible tariff? So if the problem is the duck curve and you don't have power from, your short power from 
four to six or whatever, the four to eight. Could you guarantee us power the other 20 hours of the day? But tell us that you can't meet that, say, during the summer, and we can add batteries or something like that. Like, could, could we create, work together to create these tariffs? So you're incentivizing load to come to Utah. That's the economic driver. Pacific Core is the economic driver of Utah. But they're not doing their job. So here we are trying to say, we'll help you do your job. But just help us. Guarantee us a certain amount of power during the day. And a few hours, when you can't, we'll figure that out. And so conversations that I've been having recently with Pacific Core, I think, I think, they're, I think they're to a place where they're, we're going to be able to work together on some of those tariffs. We also mentioned to them that they need to start working with NERC. Traditionally, our transmission system has been built where you have a large generator, Hunter Huntington, in Emory County, serving load to the Wasatch Front. And what happens when that line goes down? Everything stops. We should be looking at the transmission system and operating it in a more efficient manner. And we have some ideas for that. So, I mean, we're trying to solve the problem. Um, and I'm optimistic that we will. Um, so I don't want to leave here in a negative way. But um, uh, I, I, th I, think, I think we're there. And um, I appreciate your time today and look forward to any questions. Thanks, Christine. As has been discussed through the symposium, siting of renewable projects requires land. With 63% of the lands in Utah owned by the federal government and with 42% of the lands managed by the Bureau of Land Management, a successful transition will require use of federal public lands to site projects. As compared with the long history of mining and oil and gas development on federal lands, among other uses, Citing renewable projects on federal lands is a relatively new use requiring different considerations for managing the lands for these uses. I'd like to invite Michelle Campo, who serves as a Region 7 Renewable Energy Program Coordinator for the BLM, to explain how the BLM in Utah is adapting to the growing need for federal public lands for citing renewable projects. Can you hear me? Ah, it's working. Can I see your clicker? Oh, beautiful. Thank you. Well, first of all, uh, good afternoon. It's a privilege to be here. Um, this is my first time speaking in front, of, in front of this wonderful group, and I'm very excited to give a perspective from the federal government, specifically the Department of Interior, Bureau of Land Management, and thanks for the introduction. Um, my name is Michelle Campo, and like they said, uh, BLM kind of gives out long titles. I am a Renewable Energy Program Coordinator for BLM's Renewable Energy Coordination Office for Region 7, and I cover four states. I'm Utah, Colorado, New Mexico, and Wyoming. And so it's a very uh, privilege to be here. I'm gonna cover high level. I have probably changed my slides several times because there's so much fun and exciting things to talk about, but I'm keeping it focused on the energy transition in Utah and what that looks like from the federal perspective, specifically um, the BLM and lands managed by the BLM. Okay, so first um, I wanted to start out with giving you an idea about the Renewable Energy Coordination Offices. Uh, we were established as part of the um, Energy Act of 2020, and part of that establishment, um, RICOs uh, were developed. And so we have a national RICO, which is called our headquarters RICO, and then we have state and um, regional RICOs. Um, so we currently have Renewable Energy Program Coordinators in Arizona, California, Nevada, which is what we call like the trifecta, right? A lot of projects going on in public lands there. We call them the tri-states. And we have a RIGO for each state there. Um, we have Derek Eisenbaugh in Arizona, Nancy Robledo in California, and Greg Helseth in Nevada. And I don't know if I drew the short straw or not, but um, I cover four states. And so um, that's pretty, pretty fun for me because I get to see um, the big differences amongst a lot of different states. And, um, and every state is, is different versus from coming from Utah to Wyoming or um, the other two states that I cover. But part of the Energy Act of 2020, um, which is a transition for the federal government um, in um, uplifting renewable energy on public lands. And so we have that, that Energy Act, and part of the Energy Act, we also created this interagency MOU. 
and um, it talks about what kind of our roles as a RICO would be um, to um, implement improved coordination among our agencies, um, help avoid, resolve potential conflicts and bottlenecks, identify best practices, um, accelerate information sharing, and promote efficient and timely reviews and support agency decision making. So that's kind of where we're at. Um, with the RICOs, I'm the RICO for the four states. We do have a BLM National Renewable Energy Strategy. It's up there on your screen, but a Reader's Digest version of that would be um, the establishment of the RICOs, the Energy Act of 2020. We have the Executive Order um, 14008, and then we have some administration goals as well as um, direction from Congress to meet 25 gigawatts, which is 25,000 megawatts, and um, to help support that um, carbon-free power sector. Okay, so why BLM Utah? Um, as, as I said earlier, we are seeing a lot of renewable energy in California, Nevada, and Arizona. And it's just a matter of time that Utah gets a little bit more discovered. And we have been discovered. We are getting lots of renewable energy applications on public lands managed by the BLM in Utah. Um, as you can see, just based on um, how much land is managed by the BLM, Nevada is at 48 million and we're second. Utah is second, 22.8 million acres. Um, and then Wyoming having 17.5, and that's for the lower 48. Um, Alaska has about 70 million acres of public lands. And why are companies reaching out to the, to the BLM and why are they reaching out to Utah? Not only because we have lots of public lands available, state lands available, private lands. Um, we have an excellent solar, wind, and geothermal energy potential here in Utah, as I'll show you on a couple of my slides. And um, we have land sizes that would support utility scale development projects. And there are some different definitions of what utility scale is. Um, different programmatic environmental impact statements that the Bureau does, does give some definitions. And I could speak to those later. And um, we have available lands um, near major infrastructure or an opportunity to um, interconnect with generation tie lines. So first I'm gonna cover geothermal uh, typically. Um, so the Energy Act covers wind, solar, and geothermal. So I wanted to cover geothermal. And as you can see, like the, the darker red on the map is kind of where that hot water is at. And I wish I had a zoomed in picture, but I didn't wanna to create too many slides um, for the sake of time. But Utah is a leading source and has a lot of potential for geothermal. And we see that and we heard it today. We have three geothermal, um, generation power plants in the state of Utah, uh, two of which are on federal lands with a mix of private and state as well. And then we have one solely on private and state lands. Uh, Utah is poised to become the technology leader in geothermal energy dried from hot water um, and hot rock. And the cool thing about that is um, you heard on a few other presentations from different speakers is that Fervo project is kind of the leading technology right now where they're able to generate um, energy from the hot rock instead of hot water. So I really think that's gonna change the trajectory of geothermal um, in the lands of Utah and, and anywhere else on red and orange for that map. Uh, the BLM continues to hold geothermal lease cells and supports new technology and research. Wind potential, I think we've seen this map earlier in some of our presentations, but it's a good reiteration. Um, this is from NREL, and they collect a lot of really, really amazing data. And one thing I wanted to cover on here is that we might not be in the dark, dark blue where there's a lot of wind potential. And this map shows the 100 meter scale for the annual uh, wind speed. But Utah is being discovered and um, right now, BLM Utah is currently processing and analyzing five project area testing projects. So um, in our regulations, it's allowed 
to test the area to see about the wind potential. Um, it gives them a three-year authorization to test with Met Towers and also gives them time to do studies, get other federal, state, and local permits, and really see if that's a good potential site to site their development project. And usually that's the second phase of a project for wind on public lands. And then we do have one uh, proposed development project on public lands at this time. Um, interconnection is an issue for that project as well. All right, solar. Actually, I'm going to I'm going to go to the West Wide Wind Corridors first. We've been talking a lot about transmission distribution. And um, in 2009, the map on your right shows the different corridors that BLM has analyzed in a programmatic environmental impact statement. And um, we are seeing a lot of our big um, infrastructure and transmission lines go within these corridors. It does help streamline the, the process and the environmental review. And BLM is always looking forward to kind of transitioning and always improving upon things like um, where we learn more throughout these years, like do we need to remove a line? Do we need to add uh, a wider segment? Do we need to braid a segment? And as you can see on the left, that is the efforts that we're currently going and looking at. And Utah does have one near the St. George area within the St. George and Cedar City field office where we are looking at braiding um, an additional route on one of those corridors that was identified in 2009. Okay, I'm gonna go back to solar. Okay. Solar, um, another map from NREL. You can see that, of course, in the darker area will be a lot more sun that these areas get. And you can see Utah, it, it gets a lot of sun. And with the improvement in technology and PV technology, we're just seeing more and more applications coming in to, to collect that. So BLM Utah is currently processing and analyzing 11 development projects, primarily in central and southwestern portion of the state. And this is all public data. You guys can go to a website called mlrs.gov. You could pull reports and you could see what applications are coming in for wind, solar, um, mining claims, transmission lines. And uh, you guys could always reach out to me if you want to know how to do that. But that was our current numbers. I pulled that report, I think, the end of last month. And who knows, the time I've been here, there could have been more applications filed to those offices. What I try to do as a RICO, I try to meet with the company and industry and go, th I, go I have this big PowerPoint presentation that I give to them to kind of show them what map resources, what reports they could pull, um, all the different programmatics down to the land use plans to, to look at even before they're filing an application with the local field office. So we do spend a lot of time together, really trying to find a good site. I'm kind of giving them you know, things to be aware of. Um, as the federal government incentivizes renewable energy on public lands, we are seeing a lot of new companies come in that's never um, built a project on public lands before, or maybe it's completely new in uh, developing renewable energy. So I'd like to spend some time with those companies and really give them kind of a 101 on, you know, what to look like. Be and it gives them credibility um, when they go to the local office that they've done their homework, that they've done their research, and it really helps that beginning um, permitting and coordination process. So the BLM is currently working on a draft programmatic environmental impact statement um, that would supersede the 2012 solar PIS. So that was the last one that was done. And it would add five more states. So we have six states that the 2012 did, and then it would add um, five more states to that. And the comment period to that is currently open, and it, and it ends on April 18th. And I'm going to spend a little bit more of my presentation discussing that because it's kind of like the topic and the hot topic as BLM um, continues to improve and look at uh, renewable energy resources holistically and what are some of those um, exclusions or things that we think might be viable. So this is from the draft solar PEIS. You can find that on our e-planning website if you're not familiar with it. It's basically our NEPA repository where everything goes. I am the, according to the draft solar PIS, the, the preferred alternative is Alt-3, which is why I'm showing you it on the screen. But I do want to explain this map to you guys just a little bit. Um, the green is the lands that are shown as available. 
So we think after we kind of pulled up a whole bunch of different resources, which are shown in um, the light pink color, you know, after we kind of remove those, you know, key um, resources that, that wouldn't make sense to have development there. And the pink in this scenario is um, proximity to transmission. In this alternative, there was a 10 mile buffer added to the um, known and foreseeable transmission lines. And that's how you see the hot pink. If it doesn't fall in there, we um, in all three that has been determined to be potentially an exclusion area. And the green is available. Um, I did highlight the Utah numbers below and it's really important to pay attention to this because what we show as um, lands available for application doesn't mean we're going to entertain every application in there on all those acres. We're just saying after we whittled it all down, that's the numbers that are showing green. But for the next slide, if you could pay attention to the very bottom row, see these are all the 11 states. This is the, the total acres for our planning area. And then after you whittle all the exclusions out, they're looking at 22 point, it's like little over 22 million acres is lands is available in the alt three for the draft PIS. So um, in, these, in this circle right here, you can see that that bottom row right there, the very bottom row of all those totals is that circle on the left. And then the green shows that 22 million acres and what BLM is looking at in all the, in all the alts, it would apply to all alts, is the little sliver of gray of 700,000 acres. So no matter what alt is, is selected in the draft, BLM is still looking and anticipating 700,000 of BLM lands to show, to meet the reasonably foreseeable development scenario. And that was based on a Department of Energy Solar Futures study. So if we had to further break that 700,000 down, Utah's commitment all the way up to 2045 would be around 40,000 acres to meet um, those different goals in the reasonably foreseeable development. So um, I do have the QR code that'll take you to the e-planning site if you wanna know more about the draft solar PIS. There's some really good more examples in there, but this is kind of like the high level of that. And that's all I have, thank you very much. Thanks, thank you, Michelle. So we've discussed now how power providers, developers, and land managers are navigating the transition. But how is the transition impacting our communities, and especially those that historically played an integral role in the coal and natural gas production that fueled the state's growth? These communities, like Carbon County, have played a vital role in our state, not only from an energy and economic perspective, but also culturally in the vibrant communities that developed as a mining industry attracted families from all over the country and the world to the region. I'd like to invite Commissioner Tony Martinez from Carbon County to discuss what the energy transition means for Carbon County and how the county is navigating that transition. Well, thank you for that introduction. It's, it's great to be here. It's the first time I've uh, uh, been to this building. I've been to the football field quite a bit. Since we're talking alumni, uh, my mom and dad actually met on this campus. Uh, I went to a different school, USU. But my son has kept the uh, tradition going. He's currently here in the uh, engineering department. So we are Utah fans, uh, as my wife will tell you. Um, I, I appreciate the opportunity to come and talk about Carbon County. Um, it, it's where I was born, where I was raised. There's a, a big heritage there for energy production, energy transmission. Uh, as you all know, you know, coal started to be mined back in the 1880s. Uh, when the railroads were going through Utah. It was discovered in our neck of the woods. They were uh, mining coal in uh, San Pete County, Sevier County before that, but they really found the, the mother load, if you will, uh, when the railroad came through. Um, from that time, several mines have opened. Uh, there was lots of opportunity. Several immigrants came to Carbon County through the mining, through the railroads, and I didn't realize this growing up. I just thought it was just how Utah was or the world was. But we had names like uh, Yaklovich, Dimitrich, uh, Bonacci, uh, Ellington, Yazi, uh, 
just all different kinds of nationalities. And we thought that was how it was. And I really didn't realize it was different until about high school age when we got to play other schools in Utah. And it was like, oh, maybe we have something a little unique in our neck of the woods. So we've always been uh, protective, we've always respected, and we all support each other in a small community as we should. Um, you know, as you look at this graph here, that's uh, USU Eastern, uh, the university that we have in Price. Uh, it's a great campus. Um, my dad went there, I went there, my son went there, my wife. Um, but what you'll notice is in those mountains, the book cliffs to the north, uh, that's where Andalex and Tower and other coal mines were. Uh, it's about six miles away as the crow flies. Um, that's to the north. If you look towards the east, about six miles, you can't see it on this photo. Uh, that's the first solar project that was uh, built in Carbon County. Uh, hopefully we have a lot more coming. But in between those two, you have natural gas as well. Uh, that came back in like the early 1900s. Um, so we've been a, a really rich community as far as development. Uh, the next slide here, I get this right. No, there it is. Um, I shared the chair that uh, John Eagle did, so hopefully I can do this proud too. This is Nine Mile Canyon. Uh, if you haven't been to Carbon County, would recommend you, you take the time and stop and go up and see this. Uh, these are petroglyphs that were done by the Fremont Indians. And uh, there's, this is the great hunt panel. It's probably the most popular one that's in the canyon. Uh, two miles to the uh, west of this is a gas compressor station. Um, just wanted to show that, you know, we respect the land, we take care of the land, but we can still develop the land as well. And we've been pretty good stewards that way. Um, the other side of this too, this is Schofield. This is to the west of, of uh, Carbon County. This is where we get our drinking water, where we recreate, where we hunt, where we fish. But four miles away from this picture, is, there were uh, several coal mines, Winter Quarters, Skyline, White Oak. Um, that's, that's kind of the heritage. And I just wanted to show those photos to you to kind of connect this. But um, we, we have been proud to produce energy. We've been proud no matter what the source has been. Uh, growing up, you always saw the, uh, the trains go through that had the coal cars. Uh, back in the 90s, you started seeing a little bit of the oil and the gas development in our neck of the woods. Now, uh, you don't see any coal. I don't know if you guys know, but as of August 2019, there's been no coal extracted in Carbon County. Um, we still do have Skyline Mine, which operates in Carbon County, but the mineral extraction is coming in San Pete and Sevier County. So from this time, we've had to make the change. Uh, we had the carbon power plant, which if most of you have driven down to uh, Lake Powell, Moab, you may have seen it there in the canyon outside of Helper. Uh, that closed in 2015. So for us, you know, we've been through this, we've seen it. We were kind of the role model for other counties that are gonna to have to see this eventually. Uh, if you talk to the old coal miners, they'll tell you the easy coal is gone. Uh, it's getting deeper in the earth. It's harder to retract. Um, th the cost is just prohibitive to go after. There's still coal in Carbon County, but it's just like I say, it's prohibitive to chase. So what has this done for the citizens of Carbon County? Uh, there was a point we talked about 2008 where the mineral extraction was at its highest point. Uh, ironically, Carbon County had the highest mineral lease payments. Uh, we were getting anywhere from, on average, 10 to 11 million a year on mineral extraction. And so it's easy for politicians to kind of spend that, thinking that money's never gonna end. Um, to, to put that in a picture, last year, 2023, Carbon County received $232,000. Quite a far share or stretch from the 10 to $11 million. So we've had to change. Uh, did we want to? Uh, maybe not, maybe not some of the old timers, but when R plus came in, they developed the graphite solar project. There weren't really a lot of people that complained. 
Um, there were a handful that came to the commission meeting and they were wondering about land and everything that you've heard the, the negatives on with, uh, with solar. But we're a community again of generating electricity and transmission. So we've accepted that role. Um, just last week we had INLs, Idaho National Laboratories, putting on presentations at the local university talking about the transition to nuclear at the uh, power plants in Emory. Um, you know, in my lifetime, I've seen coal developed, seen gas and oil, natural gas and oil, um, solar. There's a company talking to Carbon County about moving in and developing hydrogen. Uh, now we have nuclear. Uh, we're just accepting our role to kind of keep the lights on, if you will. Um, it has been, I'm not, I don't want this to sound, <laughs> it has been a kind of a struggle at some points, but it's been more of a mind shift as well. So um, I don't wanna to get too much, I'd like to hear your questions on that, but uh, also the other side of what I do, my free time, I work for a company called Bodec, and uh, we're an EPC company. We've designed and built the uh, substation for graphite. From that, we've expanded into, um, doing a project in Cedar City called Appaloosa. Uh, we've done a project in Idaho uh, called Black Mesa. We're just gonna be starting another one called Pleasant Valley. Uh, we've done two down in Texas. So just from this one initial project that we did in Carbon County, the company that I work for, their expansion has just been phenomenal. So we've get, we get requests all over the, uh, the United States um, Minnesota, Wyoming, uh, California, uh, Louisiana. I volunteered to take all the ones that we're getting in South Carolina because I'm a bit of a golfer as well. So I, I wanted to do those, but uh, it, it's, been, it's been a very good thing. And, and it has been hard for some of those traditional families uh, to see that mining is going away. Uh, we have had people move out of the area, but those that have stayed uh, are working to kind of transform Carbon County into what it will be coming next. So uh, appreciate your time and uh, look forward to your questions. Thank you, Commissioner. All right, so this has come up several times throughout the symposium, but let's talk about coal in Utah and the most recent legislative session. I'd like to ask Sarah if she could provide us all with a general overview of what happened in this last session, which had several bills that were related to energy and particularly coal, and discuss what happened in the session and um, what finally did pass and what this means for us going forward. Sure, should we just show the slide? I wanna be pretty be as quick as I can because we don't have very much time left. And um, you heard a lot of alluding to what happened in the session. Um, there were some things that we that we tried to do that were um, positive on the energy side. We tried to improve the rooftop solar, the not to bring back full net metering, but to improve the economics. Worked on an incentive for clean trucks because a medium and heavy duty trucks, although they're not a big percentage of the vehicles, a big percentage of the greenhouse gas and also air pollution, that didn't make it, but there might be a fix coming with that and funding efficiency. So those were sort of three proactive bills we worked on that unfortunately um, didn't come out the other side. But the power sector, um, you know, I mentioned that the IRP was sort of a, a lightning rod for our legislature and um, and there were some other things that contributed to that, but that um, it was interesting from the start, our legislature was, and, and this was a quote from the, the Speaker of the House, you know, you know, we're betting on coal for now. Um, he just, and that was a sentiment through the entire legislature. And they're, they're also, and I, you know, I understand Mason, we have to keep the lights on, we have to keep the, the grid reliable. Um, and their thought is that if we keep our coal plants open, everyone in the West is going to want to buy our power going forward. And so there were four coal, coal bills um, that were passed. Some of them were changes to our energy policy and our preference, um, stating that, that you know we want to keep our coal plants open and some changing the way we think about um, decision-making around coal plants. 
Um, Mason, I don't know if you want to speak to um, SB 161 or that has to do with the IPP power plant. That's the only coal bill that hasn't been signed yet. Sure. Um, so SB 161, um, this affects the Intermountain Coal Project, uh, which is owned by the Intermountain Power Agency. It's a similar interlocal entity to UAMPS, but it is distinct from UAMPS. Um, we do have overlapping members. Um, for those that aren't aware, um, the majority of this power historically has gone to Southern California, LADWP primarily. Um, going back um, about 10, year, 10 years ago, they started planning to convert this facility to a natural gas facility. Um, that construction is well underway. They'll probably be commissioning the natural gas units around this time next year. And that facility has the ability to um, burn both um, natural gas and hydrogen. It's an exciting conversion project. Uh, what this bill seeks to do, a couple things. Um, one is uh, in light of the legislature's desire to keep coal going, they've wanted um, IPA to submit a request to effectively end their, or amend, excuse me, their Clean Air Act permit. Um, so you would have effectively um, their existing coal Clean Air Act permit and then their natural gas plant Clean Air Act permit. It's a novel um, air permitting concept. The state of Texas has done it. Um, so I'd say it's novel, and I think when you start using that words as a recovering attorney like I am, um, you can read into that what you will. Um, but um, other things, it's, it's really setting forth the process to keep the project going. Um, you know, there's potential to sell it. Um, if there is an interested buyer, if not, then the state can take it. Um, so that's, I think, it in a nutshell. Um, if there's anything you thought I left off there. No, I think that's great. There was a good, um, the TRIB editorial, editorial board did a recent um, op-ed or editorial on why the governor should veto this bill. So, um, The other coal bill, the one that it, I think was most problematic from a ratepayer's perspective, and it came out, so we have a very short session. We have a seven-week session in Utah. Um, and this bill came out the Friday afternoon, late afternoon of the fifth week. And this is a bill that completely upended the way utilities are regulated and regulatory oversight for what they call proven dispatchable resources. So usually we have a monopoly utility. They have a, they have a, a right to serve and an obligation to serve. And in exchange for that, they get uh, approximately a guaranteed 10% rate of return on all their prudent investments. And it's their job to prove that those investments are cost effective and in the public interest. What this legislation do did and what our, what our legislature, they decided that instead of the, anything that has to do with coal plants is economic, basically. And if they're, what happens now is that basically consumers, ratepayers have to prove that it's not economic. And so they have flipped the regulatory compact that we've had for decades and decades on its head. And they did this with just a few weeks, you know, a couple weeks of, um, of public input. Um, and so we, you know, many of us, different groups have worked. We work with WRA on this and with energy users. Even our previous Republican chair of the Public Service Commission wrote to the legislature about how, what a bad idea this was. But it has passed. And so now the trick will be to find how can we as advocates and other consumers to show that there are more economic resources to go forward. And so now it sort of ups our game in the regulatory arena. Um, but because renewables are so economic, because coal is so much more expensive than it used to be, I think that it's open, we're, you know, we're open, there's things we can do. And I'll also say that um, it could open the door for some other proven dispatchable resources like geothermal and, um, and so I just, there's, 
maybe we should should we just stick to the coal bill since we don't have very much time yeah, that makes sense yeah sure so Mason, you touched on this a bit during your presentation, but the role of coal in UAMP's portfolio, um, you know, from your perspective, is it cost effective to keep these plants open? What's sort of the reality um, with these plants? Yeah, I mean, the reality is that, um, you know, we've seen it in Utah, we've seen it nationwide, um, a fuel switch from coal to natural gas. Um, reasons for that, um, the price of coal has increased, um, and you know there's reasons like Tony mentioned. Um, mineable coal um, is getting harder to access. Uh, coal miners have higher costs of capital than, say, oil and gas. Um, oil and gas has got much lower cost of capital, so the fuel is much cheaper. Um, as far as um, whether they're overall economic, um, you know, it is going to be very dependent on um, the coal pricing. It's probably the largest driving factor in the economics um, for UAMPs in particular. All of our uh, associated debt for our involvement in the Hunter Coal Project is paid off. Um, so we don't have any sort of ongoing debt service obligations. Uh, we do see it economic. Um, you know, again, but it's it's going to be a very um, transition-oriented process to um, move away from coal, so it does not have rate impacts to our member communities. Because as we think about this energy transition, um, we're talking about putting a significant amount of capital investment into the system, which has to then be covered by our ratepayers. And just to maybe give a further glimpse into public power. Um, distinct from investor-owned utilities, our ratepayers are effectively our shareholders. So we don't have sort of some paradox going on. Um, so we're very serious about when we're doing these new capital investments, um, what they are going to ultimately end up impacting these communities where we serve. Thanks, Mason. And Commissioner Martinez, what do you think the, the results of this legislative session mean for Carbon County? I mean, what's the uh, reaction in your community? Uh, obviously, the coal miners are happy. Um, again, you know, uh, we had one company that since I, this is my fifth year in office, uh, we've had one company come to us and talk about opening potentially another coal mine. Uh, that's not going to happen, I believe, in our county. Uh, to see that the neighbors uh, are still employed and have jobs, I, I, I can't argue against that. Um, but eventually, again, um, my concern for the IRP with Emory County and those two power plants over there is I don't know that the coal will, will go that, that way as far as Utah coal. Uh, the reason I say that is the mine that closed in 2019 was supposed to go till this year, and it didn't. Uh, the other two mines that are along uh, the mountain range there that are on the book cliffs uh, have closed. Uh, Lila Canyon closed. That's three million tons worth of coal that Wolverine was using on. So, if, if there's any other hydro events, fire events, cave-ins, any other potential issues, I think it's going to be tough for Utah Coal to get those uh, power plants in Emory uh, burning coal until uh, the 2030s. So that's my concern. And Christine, as a renewable energy developer in Utah, you know what does this this state legislative session for you signal as a renewable energy developer? Does it discourage development or does it have an effect at all? Well, it's um, it's ironic because I, I think Sarah might remember this probably in 2002 or around then. We we met with uh, Deseret g and who's the resource provider for all of the rural electric co-ops the state. And Sarah and I were trying to pass a renewable energy portfolio standard, which base, basically we were trying to um, mandate the utility to have a certain percentage of renewables. And, and during that meeting, um, uh, the head of, of the G&T at the, of Deseret at the time just looked at us and said, you know, markets over, over mandates. And and one of the one of the members of, of one of those electric co-ops. Co I'm not going to say his name, but his name may have been on the bill. Um, you know, uh, 
So I, I, I sent him a note, uh, I don't know, a week before the bill was passed, and I said, hey, before this legislative session, I reached out to you. I told you I wanted to bring load to your community that's struggling. I want to bring whatever, let's call it a green aluminum facility to your, to your, to your community, and you didn't respond to me. I said, so and now you have this bill. He's like, coal, coal, coal. Everybody wants coal. <laughs> and I thought, no, no, no. I don't want coal. I want green electrons to supply my green, <laughs> my green aluminum smelter so that we can compete globally. And so I just, you know, for me as a rate payer, for me as a developer, for me as somebody who I'm, you know, t 20 years ago, if you look at your cell phone, right? Like we didn't have this. This, this controls our files, I can look at my files, I can look at a power purchase agreement I'm negotiating. Like This is the, right, the future is ahead. I, when, I, when I hear comments like coal, 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 everybody wants coal, data center wants coal, everybody wants coal, that is not, that's not the answer, right? And so for me, I, I always look to Wyoming, I was telling everybody before, I looked at Wyoming as like the crazy legislators and I always told them like, why can't you be like Utah? You know, Governor Herbert used to say, you know, Utah's open for business. And, uh, and I just suddenly thought, okay, we're now we're Wyoming. Um, so, so for me as a developer, we'll keep going and we're just gonna keep plotting ahead and I'll keep calling the Senator and saying, I'm here when you wanna talk, let's talk economic development. But um, for 23 years I've persevered. So I'm not, I'm, not shy about, uh, I'm not shy about the future, but it just might take a little longer. Well, I, I think one of the takeaways with the session too is that we obviously need um, dispatchable base load energy. And so something that's been offered as a replacement is nuclear. And so Mason, with um, you've had experience with this with your new scale project. And so just wanted to discuss with you or have you explained to us what the challenges are with nuclear and what opportunities that you see that there are for that development in the future. Sure. Um... So, I mean, from the UAMP's experience developing new nuclear, um, you know, our, the reason why we terminated our project back in the fall of this year was not for technical permitting issues. Um, it was really for commercial issues. Um, and as we look to get more co-owners in the project to share some of the risk of developing this type of first-of-a-kind project, um, again and again, we ran into concerns about, well, what, it's, what is it ultimately going to end up costing to construct? Um, and that is a big barrier to moving new nuclear forward right now. Um, and over really kind of over the last year, there's been a significant discussion um, nationwide. DOE came out with a report that identified the possibility of doing federal construction cost overrun insurance that would serve as a financial backstop if you ran into construction cost overruns. Um, so I see that as something in particular that can really um, allow new nuclear to move forward in this country. Um, as we look at the challenge of the energy transition, I really do not see how we're going to be successful in a reasonable timeline without doing new nuclear. That's why um, we're very bullish on nuclear moving forward. Um, we see it as an overall um, diversity in the resource portfolios for the members um, and think that there's going to be economic advantages if we can get some of these projects over the finish line. Um, that's sort of the UAMS perspective, um, how it could impact and stabilize rates amongst the members, you know, with a lot of renewables, frankly, um, as we've discussed Renewables are the low cost option, but we need to figure out what the rest of the resource mix like, looks like for the members. Um, my other point is that I think there's a huge opportunity to transition some of these coal communities with new nuclear um, to be very blunt about the jobs associated with renewables. Um, it's great, um, but they are not equivalent um, in scope, scale to uh, the jobs of the coal communities. It's just the facts of it. Um, so I think there's a real opportunity. Is it challenging? Yes, um, absolutely. I think um, we understand that having been developing one of these projects for 10 years, our communities understand it. Um, but it's something I feel like we, we have to do um, 
along with all the other resource options. Great, thanks Mason. And Michelle, I believe that you're also um, involved with some uh, storage projects on, the, on BLM lands, if you can explain what the BLM, how they're starting in, to incorporate those. Yeah, actually we have um, seen a, almost every application we're seeing for wind or solar development projects is accompanied by battery storage proposals as well. Um, unlike geothermal, which could run almost 24 seven because they have a higher net capacity factor, solar and wind doesn't have that. Um, wind is only producing when it's windy and solar is only producing when the sun is shining. So the opportunities um, for battery storage and going into the grid is, is huge. And we're seeing uh, an upper trajectory of that and where that used to not be. An example is Milford Wind Corridor. They don't have battery storage. Um, some other uh, solar projects uh, around the region doesn't have battery storage, but almost every new application, okay, um, yeah all new applications basically on public lands that I'm seeing is incorporating battery storage. So it's a trend, especially for wind and solar. Great, thank you. Moving on again, um, I wanted to touch quickly on, we've heard through the symposium how there's been a lot of community backlash around the country uh, with respect to development of renewable projects. And so just wanted to go through the panel and see if you've been, we've been seeing this in Utah and, and what kind of response we've been seeing locally. So um, Commissioner Martinez, if you don't mind if we start with you. Sure. Um, yeah, I, I think, I think um, the, the folks that we heard, uh, heard from when the first solar project was coming in was more, they thought that the solar was gonna take their job away. Um, again, I touched on the heritage of Carbon County and, and being coal miners, um, but the land that uh, they put the solar on was hadn't been utilized for generations. Uh, it wasn't the most fertile ground down there. Uh, uh, frankly, it was ideal for a solar project. Um, and frankly, they're talking about a second one that'll be just adjacent to it. And another company's looking at building one just to the north of that. So um, I, I think that there's kind of an unknown, maybe is what happens. Uh, the, the more that companies can reach out and communicate with the locals, uh, it kind of eases, eases that a little bit. So uh, that's kind of my feedback on them. Great. And Michelle, what, from your perspective, what are you seeing on BLM lands? Yeah, well, we actually encourage um, community outreach and support and definitely want to know their thoughts and feelings on projects on public lands. Not only is that built into our NEPA process, but um, when our 2016 regulations were updated, we are required to have application review meetings um, prior to the NEPA phase to get that early involvement and coordination with federal, state, local, tribal um, communities. And so we definitely get a lot of uh, community responses, but we're always trying to improve that process. And we definitely encourage uh, com community response, state response, federal response, tribal response, and um, I, I would say we definitely get a lot of comments on our projects, almost that touches every resource, but we definitely encourage and, and it just builds um, community growth, um, engagement. And so I would look at it from a positive perspective and say, we, we encourage it, come talk to us. And Christine, as a developer, the communities that you're going into, are you, have you seen a change from the first wind project you did to now? <laughs> Well, um, let's be frank, a wind project is very different than a solar project. Um, so on the solar side, we've developed um, for, in four counties in Utah, um, we, we permitted a, a solar project, 300 megawatts out the back door of the Hunter coal plant. Um, and, and when we develop a project, wind or solar, we always put together a website, and on that website, we try to include all the studies that we've um, conducted for the site. If so, if it's a wind site, it would be shadow flicker, property values. Um, we'll put some of our environmental data. So we try to be really transparent. Um, 
And, but in, but in Utah at that particular coal plant, I was very, yeah, I thought, oh gosh, we're going to have to go. Um, we're really going to have to hit the ground running. We're going to have to have, op you know, meetings, town hall meetings and the website and really get out there. And as it turned out, we just, we just showed up at the planning commission meeting. The football coach came in at noon and they voted and that was it. And uh, so, you know, I haven't on the solar side, I really haven't seen, um, in, in, in Utah, I haven't, I haven't seen any any kind of opposition. Um, on the wind side, um, uh, I would say we ended up at the Wyoming Supreme Court on a land use issue, um, largely because we um, decided to um, engage with one of the larger, or the, I guess he was a billionaire landowner and said, if you don't want to sign a lease with us, we'll surround you with turbines. That wasn't very good. And so, but then we signed up his brother, another billionaire, and uh, um, but 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 essentially, what we had done in that case, we had created a firestorm, um, and and so deep pockets um, can 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 really slow you down if you're not careful. And that that wasn't me. I didn't I didn't make that comment. But um, so uh, <laughs> but but I think early early engagement matters. Wind is is is, is difficult, um, especially in Wyoming when you know you're talking about jobs at the dave johnston power plant that people are fear fearing losing so there's there's that balance but you know wyoming and utah are, are both um private property rights states and so at the end of the day um whether these county commissioners like or, or don't like your your project you know you, you can't you can't get the ground for free right so um we've never in wyoming we've never seen a situation at the industrial siting council so in wyoming there's you have to go through the county process and then a statewide process in utah you have the county process which might just be at the planning commission not even the county commission but in in wyoming it's it's more difficult but there's never been a project that's gone through the industrial siting council that's been denied um so we haven't yet seen the the groundswell of of um opposition that other states have seen we haven't seen those deep pocketed um call it anti um, renewables contingency yet here in the west where i know that's that's very much part of uh, development in ohio and other states so can i add something to this please do And this isn't maybe this isn't what I hear more are general complaints about why aren't we doing more distributed um, energy? And I think that it's really both. I think we do need to ramp up the amount of distributed energy we do because that does lessen the impact on the lands. But it's it's going to be maybe max if we really went all out. It would maybe be 10 percent of our energy demands, and we're way below that right now. And the other thing is really ramping up our efficiency because. The more efficient we build our homes and our buildings and our industries, the less generation we have to build. And those are two of the things that I think that we need to consider as we um, move forward in this transition. And I just want to, can I take this point to say, Utah Clean Energy will be opening a climate innovation center. It's a small building downtown, all net zero, super efficient in June. So I hope to see some of you there. <laughs> Thank you. And I was having an issue with Slido, so wasn't getting seeing a lot of the questions coming in. So we're going to try to cover a few of these here. Um, sir, what do you think about John Curtis's Conservative Climate Caucus, um, his personal politics on the subject? Is he doing anything helpful or is it um, simply pushing carbon capture? No, I, I mean, John Curtis's heart is in the right place. He understands that we need to transition and he understands that we need conservatives at the table. While we didn't get conservatives voting in favor of the IRA, it, I think it is definitely helping move the agenda forward. And we just need to all be at the table to figure out how we're going to do this. And Congressman Curtis is helping bring people to the table. A question for Christine. You'd mentioned a flexible tariff. Could you please explain that further? I'm good. Uh, I'm okay. I'm, what, what's the saying? Uh, master of none. Or what, what's the... Yeah. <laughs> anyway, um, so uh, I'm happy to explain it more. Um, but, but basically, the, the tariff would look something like this. If Pacific Corps could idea, identify the times of the day where they're, they're short, um, we would ask, we would, we, the tariff would say something like, 
we will supply Pacific Core will sl supply you 95% of the time, but this time we know we can't. And so we'll allow you to move forward with your load um, under this circumstance. Um, the, the idea really stems from trying to match the load with the generation. So our thoughts are we should be looking at where are the resources. So Milford, we've ta been talking about the geothermal fervo. They have, I mean, they, they said on a call they have about, I don't know, 3,000 megawatts, they think, of economical geothermal that they can, they can have there. So can we bring load to that same location, and can we work with Pacific Core without sitting in the interconnection queue on a tariff that says if you pair the wind or the, if you pair the renewables and the, uh, the, sorry, the renewables with the load, there's a tariff that you can essentially maybe jump the queue and we'll provide you power because we know you can during these times of the day and the times that you can't, you, you load, need to modulate your power needs or supplement it with storage. So I'm not an expert. This is my partner's great idea, um, but I'm happy to, I've got some slides here. I'm happy to share, share those with anybody that's interested because um, we're a small company and there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of things you need to do to pass regulation as Sarah knows. And there are a lot of people that need to come along with you. So I'm happy to share it and love to work with anybody in this room on the concept. Thank you. And a question for Michelle. Uh, with respect to the BLM planning, can you talk about the importance of the proximity to transmission on-ramps to potential renewable development? Proximity to transmission, what was the rest of it? Um, I think just generally the, how, how BLM, I think, is incorporating into their planning the location of transmission lines for interconnection. Yeah, I assume this might be related to the solar 10-mile um, um, exclusion that they're putting um, related to transmission. Uh, we're certainly seeing all the applications that are being filed are already close to transmission, existing or planned transmission. Um, so that was just an added later in the solar PIS. However, um, we don't want to limit too much. Uh, we see like the Milford Wind Project, they built a line all the way to Delta, knowing that um, that was a substantial cost to them at the time for that line. And um, it it's probably you know under 100 miles but that was their choice in their business model but um for the solar pis it is an alternative that's being considered is that 10 mile buffer but i will say that um the the uptick in applications that we're seeing are being cited closer to transmission or section 368 corridors great and we have just about under one minute left so i'm going to run through quickly um if you guys just have a couple word response to this when you envision utah's energy and future in 2035 what do you see what do you think is a number one priority for what needs to happen to ensure a healthy and thriving communities in our state so commissioner martinez we'll start on your end you want one word or two words uh, or? briefly <laughs> okay. uh, it, honestly it'll be diversified uh it'll be different than we have it today uh, I'm hoping that coal, and I know, I, I'm hoping that baseline energy will be a big part of that. Are we going down the line? All right. Uh, I see hope in uh, Utah's renewable energy future, um, making continued advancements and efforts to improve energy efficiency and grid resilience. Um, I think to I think to bridge the gap in the interim, we're going to have to see some more peaking plants. I agree with Mason there, but what I see by 2035 is um, that we're going to see those peaking plants and other uh, gas plants being um, having natural gas, not as the primary source, but hydrogen and green ammonia. That's how I see our bridge. And then I think we're going to see a lot of battery storage, long duration storage. We didn't speak too much about that, but um, the technology with battery storage that lasts, you know, a week or so. Um, lots of renewables, including geothermal and maybe nuclear. I agree as far as the 2035 um, outlook sort of being diversified. I agree with Tony on that. We're going to be receiving energy in the state from a lot more resources than we ever have. Um, to get there, I think it's just going to take some fundamental hard work. I mean, I, I don't think anything about the energy transitions 
um, particularly mind blowing. It's just, we're going to have to do all the fundamentals that, um, frankly, we maybe haven't been as mindful over the last 10 or so years about, um, we're gonna have to communicate better. I think a lot of the stuff going on at the legislature this last year was a lack of communication for the last five or six years. Um, that's unfortunate. I think, you know, utilities, stakeholders, we're all part of that, the legislature. So, um, I look forward to changing that moving forward. I agree. We need to have lots more conversations. And I think um, I'll just say super efficient. We're going to change the way that we build our buildings. We're going to take the Inflation Reduction Act money and start doing a lot of retrofits. Um, solar for all money, which is money that's for low income solar. We're going to implement that. And we're really it's about resiliency and clean and re moving we should be really far along in decarbonizing by then because frankly, um, failure is not an option when we think about the world that we wanna leave the next generation. Great, well thank you to our panelists and thank you to you all. Um, and thank you very much to the Stegner Center. Let me extend my thanks to the uh, panelists uh, and to uh, my former student, uh, Becky Johnson, who uh, organized this.